Thank you. Then uh, uh, I thank um, uh, the Polito and especially the DISMA. Um, um, is it uh, the department? Sorry for the my bad Italian. And uh, uh, especially Marcello uh, to, for inviting me to give this talk that I'll try to make not too long because uh, it's possible for me to walk for to talk for hours, but this will not be the case. So uh, uh, with you, you have now Tommaso Lorenzi, uh, as I learned, who was a, a big contributor to this part of uh, research that was uh, designed uh, first uh, introduced by Benoit Pertam at the Laboratoire Jacques Louis Lyons. And uh, at that time, uh, he was a postdoc with uh, Rebecca Chisholm. And we worked together with Alexander Lortz, later Camille Pouchel, Emmanuel Trella. So this is a joint work uh, for modeling. But uh, you will see um, at the end of my talk, maybe, that uh, I have also, uh, let's say, personal views that. Uh, uh, in principle, as I learned recently, uh, should resort to um, what is called now philosophy of cancer. So, uh, can I uh, um, make the, how should I, uh, um, I don't see any way to, to progress, um, uh, maybe, yes, yes, this works, perfect. So, uh, my um, starting point was and it's still about cancer. So cancer, everybody should know that it's not a disease of single cells, but of multicellular organisms. And uh, it makes sense indeed to look for manifestation of cancer in, uh, um, in as much as it is a disease of multicellular organism. Because you can find things, uh, of course, uh, tracks of cancer in single cell, but it's never, never enough. We must see, and this I will try to develop in this talk, uh, cancer as a loss of cohesion between cells and tissues in a multicellular organism. It begins by uh, local manifestations, and then it develops and uh, invades. But first of all, it's a localized loss of cohesion. And uh, uh, some of you may know that I, I try to advocate the atavistic hypothesis of cancer, which was introduced by Davis, Lane Weaver, and Vincent 10 years ago, as uh, can cancer being seen as a sort of reverse evolution towards a very elementary and disorganized state of multicellularity. Um, there have been uh, um, sort of evidence, I, it's not uh, always admitted that it's evidence, but coming from uh, people uh, uh, who evidenced uh, genes of multicellularity that are the same as genes expressed in cancer, these people are Domazet, Losho and Tauts, and more recently uh, an Australian team around uh, Anna Trigger. So, so the general question I will ask about uh, um, this question of cancer is what is coherent in a, or cohesion in a multicellular organism and why and how is it disrupted in cancer. You will see that I will use the words to so the term coherence or cohesion. In my mind coherence is uh, more uh, properly used about signals and cohesion about tissue. So um, we have uh, the uh, need to, to see evolution in cancer at, in fact, uh, two different uh, timescales. One is the uh, timescale of the great evolution, uh, the Darwinian evolution, which is concerned with uh, genetic mutations, and uh, that has developed uh, more and more uh, complex systems of uh, multicellular organisms, and uh, uh, also on uh, smaller time windows, which are the windows, the time windows of um, uh, human life or human disease, and it can concern genetic mutations, but it can also concern non-genetic uh, adaptations, in particular um, due to hostile environments such as our uh, exposure to drug diseases, to drug uh, 
uh, to anti-cancer drugs. Sorry. So um, you can have seen uh, recently that heterogeneity is very often mentioned as a manifestation of uh, a cancer and which makes it very difficult to, to treat. But to my eyes, uh, heterogeneity is not the cause of uh, what makes it difficult to treat cancer. In fact, the cause is certainly more about phenotypic variability, at times also genetic variability, but it's more generally plasticity in cancer cell, that is the propension of uh, generally of epigenetic nature, because usually it's uh, reversible, uh, to develop a sort of de-differentiated status going to, um, towards stem cell status, not to the stem cell status in, in general, but that makes uh, a cancer cell and more generally cancer cell population uh, able to resist uh, drug insults and other therapeutics. And um, as you may have noticed or I tried to, to show you, it's certainly very often reversible. It's uh, not gen of genetic nature, but of um, phenotypic uh, modification nature. And uh, what is more interesting is that uh, for us, PDEs, I, PDEs, I, wish I, I should say, uh, this plasticity, reversible, is easily captured by uh, mathematical models that are uh, cell population models are structured according to continuous phenotypic variables, or if you prefer, internal traits. That should be continuous because it is um, much, uh, I would say, uh, um, close to reality to define these um, variables as continuous rather than just a binary as, a, for instance, as far as a drug resistance is, is concerned, just sensitivity or resistance. It's more like a continuum. And uh, you will see also that uh, thanks to uh, more recent works with uh, uh, the PhD student, uh, Camille Pouchol, we heard with Emmanuel Trella, who is presently um, as an associate professor in the um, University of Paris. Um, uh, you, you will see that they are compatible with uh, optimal control problems by combinations of drugs. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh yes, this here it comes. Uh, I will present to you now um, schematically what drove us with Tomaso and Rebecca to design a, a model that was published uh, in uh, Cancer Research in um, 2015. And it was uh, uh, shown to us by uh, an evolutionary biologist. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is that first of all, it's a reversible manifestation of uh, um, adaptation to, uh, to a drug, a very uh, aggressive drug in a very aggressive cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, and uh, at uh, very high doses. Uh, and what you um, observe in petri dishes is that these cells that are, uh, have uh, uh, joined together and occupy the whole of the petri dish, when you expose them to a very aggressive drug, uh, almost completely disappear. They disappear up to um, uh, 99 uh, and more than 99%, but some uh, islets uh, stay and these islets are at first very tiny, but just uh, able to survive. So they are what uh, are called uh, Dracteron persisters, or DTP. This word comes from bacteriology, in fact, because you can observe the same phenomenon in bacteriology. And what is more interesting is that after some time, a new phenotype occurs with exactly the same uh, drug uh, those uh, in the petri dish bath and according to which these um, cells begin to develop again they thrive and they are perfectly adapted to the um, uh, drug insults which doesn't uh, harm them anymore and what is even more interesting is that when you wash out 
the drug um, in, in the bath, then these uh, adapted cells, little by little, it takes some time, uh, disappear and uh, the, the cells become sensitive again to the drug exactly as uh, was the case in the beginning. So it's completely reversible. And uh, if you, you begin to do it again, you will see exactly the, the same thing, which means that the genetic, uh, the genome of these um, cells is preserved and uh, they have been able to adapt phenotypically. And uh, also, why is it of uh, epigenetic nature? Well, it's because uh, this is a strong argument, at least, uh, the inhibition of an epigenetic en enzyme, uh, KDM5A, which is a demethylase uh, on the histones, 5A, on the histone 5A, blocks the emergence of DTPs. So this was the object of um, an article uh, we published with uh, Rebecca Chisholm and uh, Thomas Lorenzin in um, uh, 2015. And uh, I will not mention it here, but uh, by lack of time, but of course uh, I uh, suggest that you can go and read this uh, paper, which is not full of theorems, there's none in fact, but it's, uh, um, shows that uh, with the model it's absolutely possible to uh, mimic what has been observed in the clinic. So is it genetic or is it um, phenotypic? This, um, um, as, you, as you can see, this mechanism seems to be uh, of a phenotypic nature that is more likely of epigenetic nature. But uh, you can never uh, exclude that after some non-genetic adaptation, reversible mechanisms uh, make it possible for uh, branching, for genetic branching, and that then these mechanisms make the uh, cell population uh, genetically adapted. Then it's what uh, biologists now call drug resistance. In the first case, uh, when it's reversible, this is what they call drug tolerance. When it's ir irreversible, or likely of genetic uh, origin, they call it drug resistance. So, as I said, prolonged tolerance may induce stable persistence. And this uh, may be documented also in an article uh, like this one, uh, um, epigenetic or genetic, two sides of the same coin um, article from about um, uh, 10 years ago. So, um, okay, yes, here it comes. Now, what are these uh, reversible mechanisms very, that makes uh, this cell population very plastic and uh, to what extent are they physiological? They are physiological, in fact, in uh, some, uh, very uh, important uh, mechanism, which is embryogenesis. In embryogenesis, uh, which from which we all come uh, as humans, as animals in general, um, physical, physiological cell populations are certainly able to develop plasticity and uh, be able to, uh, to adapt, in fact, not to an environment, but to adapt to themselves, that is, by self-organization, they are able to follow a genetic program and uh, um, their plasticity makes them able to uh, develop the, the shapes, the form that we, we know of uh, about embryology coming to uh, uh, animal babies. What is the nature of these um, auto self-organization? We have some... Uh, uh, knowledge about this already, and uh, I would like for you to to consult uh, uh, some um, uh, articles by uh, Thomas Lecuy, who is a professor at the Collège de France and who recently published a paper in uh, Nature uh, Reviews about uh, molecular cell biology. So this year, uh, with uh, uh, somebody I don't know, Claudio Collinet, who must be Italian by his name, but uh, it's very interesting uh, distinguish, um, distinction between 
the program, the genetic program and the self-organization. And in the self-organization, plasticity is essential. Whereas in the genetic program, of course not. And uh, interesting, we should know also that uh, in some uh, elaborate uh, vertebrates, some of these are able to regenerate the missing limb like the axolotls. So this uh, uh, plasticity of uh, some tissues uh, is not completely lost uh, at uh, uh, an adult state. But for us, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, that depends on the point of view, it is lost. And only uh, cancer cell population, uh, cancer cell populations are able to develop such plasticity and make uh, possible resistance to drug insults, whereas, as you know, uh, healthy cell populations are not. So, next. Uh, ah, here it comes. Yes, what is plasticity then? Well, I, I see plasticity as a loss of control and differentiations in a multicellular organism. And this can be seen uh, as a blockade on the uh, tree of differentiations, which is uh, evidence in the case of uh, acute myeloid leukemia, because you may know that there is a classification which is supposed to be French, American, British, in which uh, there's a, uh, a ranking according to the stage of differentiation at which there is a blockade. So it's not necessarily uh, re resorting to stem cells, absolutely not. It may be at any uh, stage of differentiation that there is this blockade. And uh, here you, you have um, um, biological considerations of which uh, I'm not a specialist, but I will send you to the paper we wrote with our um, biologist colleague, uh, Shen Sishen, which has been published um, uh, recently uh, and available on my, uh, on my website. So an, another example of uh, plasticity in cancer cell is the EMT, the epithelial to mesenchymal transition, which is possible in uh, uh, cells that uh, develop as a, a fibroblast, that is a mesenchymal state, but in principle, uh, healthy cells should not develop uh, this uh, um, EMT, and except, of course, uh, uh, at the um, uh, stage of a repair. Uh, wound repair, for instance, wound healing is a case of, uh, of EMT, but uh, it's uh, very special and uh, it's a, a mechanism that is uh, used by uh, cancer cells to develop um, invasion. So plasticity, uh, either by, um, blocking, uh, by blocking differentiation, uh, for instance, or also by transdifferentiation in these uh, biological uh, examples, or by EMT is essential and uh, is a very um, a problem about cancer cell populations and tissues. As I said, cancer stem cells are not necessary to be considered uh, because of this uh, example of a blockade of differentiation that is known in uh, the case of AML. Uh, so, what should be considered as essential in this plasticity is just a perturbation, a disruption of the control of differentiation, and not necessarily only at the stem cell state. So now I will try to uh, develop briefly what is the atavistic theory of cancer, which was, uh, it's uh, in fact uh, rather old, it was mentioned by uh, Theodore Bovry and more recently by uh, Lucien Israel, uh, an oncologist, a French oncologist, but uh, it has uh, been um, put forward on the, on the scene by uh, Davis and Line Weaver and uh, also Mark Vincent in, um, 10 years ago. And it states that from mammalian capabilities that we have developed uh, recently, from vertebrate capabilities, there's a possibility to revert 
to multi-serometazoan capabilities and the very beginning before these multi-serometazoan capabilities that are the uh, uh, first attempt towards multicellularity that were unsuccessful and uh, that were at the stage of the uh, last uh, eukaryotic uh, common ancestor here. That is, uh, let's say, about uh, one billion years ago. So uh, this is a view that is uh, not really admitted by a cancer biologist, but it's very attractive um, for me. And uh, in particular, because of this fact that uh, these phylostratigraphic analysis that uh, have been uh, developed by the mazet and Tauts and later by Anatrigos um, uh, show that um, the same genes, that, as I said previously, that are concerned, altered in cancer, are also those that are uh, essential to the development of multicellularity. So my view is that uh, in evolution, you may have developed uh, from a, a first stage of the rocket, if you want, that, which is proliferation with some uh, control, uh, either by quorum sensing or later by apoptosis. Then, fine, more in a more in a final way, you have developed in these uh, cell colonies uh, differentiation towards division of work, but this was still uh, not completely uh, organized. But finally, in the third stage of this rocket, the epigenetic control of differentiation and also proliferation has come, making the, the whole rocket um, very well organized. And this is exactly the reverse order in which um, mutations are seen uh, in this uh, paper by um, my hematologist colleague, uh, Pierre Hirsch, that is in uh, the in fresh blood samples from uh, AML patients, uh, you can see that the first genes that are altered are epigenetic uh, enzyme, enzyme genes, then uh, genes concerned with cell differentiation, and finally, last, the genes concerned with the proliferation and control of proliferation, such as, uh, for instance, uh, P53. So it's a... Um, it's a way to, to see this uh, evolution uh, towards multicellularity and the reverse evolution, which is not, this is my view, in fact, it's not in the atavistic theory of cancer, but I think that it completes it uh, nicely. Uh, and uh, this could be a way to have uh, open windows on this um, development of multicellularity and reverse development uh, of cancer towards um, um, badly organized um, multicellularity. And as uh, Mark Vincent noticed, um, when we attack cancer on proliferation, we are attacking the, the first the ground uh, star of the rocket, where the rocket is, that is cancer, is uh, the, um, um, the more solid. And it would be, and it is in fact much more interesting when you attack it um, from uh, another point of view, and this has begun with immunotherapy. But by the end of this talk, I'll try to present uh, other suggestions. So you all know the uh, Wellington epigenetic landscape, which has been uh, revisited by Sue Huang from the from point of view of systems biology. Let me mention that it's about a completely healthy uh, differentiation. When you consider this scenery, then you are within uh, a completely normal uh, organism, multicellular organism, and this represents differentiation until differentiated, fully differentiated cell types that are at the end of um, this uh, scenery. And uh, the reverse of this uh, Weddington landscape is here. It uh, uh, tries to represent the fact that this scenery is in fact constituted by uh, um, by uh, stable um, uh, mechanisms, which may be represented by uh, ordinary differential equations. So we went too far. But to these two um, metaphors, I will add uh, another personal metaphor that I uh, developed, uh, but without these uh, pictures in this paper in Frontier Gen in Genetics last year which is what I call the Wickerward basket. In fact, this basket 
is uh, a light shading um, appliance that uh, I took as a photograph from my kitchen ceiling. And I found it very uh, um, representative of what we may see in a simpler way, of course, of what development of multicellularity may look like. From a basis here, which is what uh, evolutionary biologists call the body plan, then develop, you can see developing twigs or trees of differentiation towards the tip of this basket, which are constituted of um, uh, completely differentiated uh, cell types. And you have um, not only control of um, these uh, differentiation twigs uh, in a vertical way, but also in a horizontal way that is trying to represent uh, the compatibility uh, between these cell types. And uh, this compatibility must uh, also extend uh, towards cooperativity. So this should be uh, what I call um, the, the task of uh, the cohesion watch. So body plan differentiation trees and cohesion watch, which is a, a part of the immune system. The immune system should not be restricted to uh, the immune response by lymphocytes, uh, NK cells, etc. But it's something um, on which uh, I have uh, some ideas coming from the genetic program. And uh, this uh, cohesion watch is part of the immune system. In fact, uh, in my view, it is, um, in fact, uh, uh, thanks to uh, my listening to the lectures of uh, Thomas Lecuy at the Collège de France, it might be related to position information that is active during embryogenesis, but also uh, maintained at uh, adult stages. So these uh, three things, uh, cohesion watch, exerted to body plant differentiation trees, make the cohesion of the organism. Let's see, yes. Now, a bit of math. Uh, what we have used with um, um, first uh, Tommaso Lorenzi and later Camille Pouchol are structured equations for heterogeneous populations, cell populations. So it's a very general way of seeing uh, a structured population. You have uh, an evolution um, equation which is still not represented here, but its heterogeneity or biological variability is coded, is characterized by a trait. Here, in a simple way, it's represented by a, a one-dimensional trait. And uh, when you integrate the um, population, the cell or the population density in general, with respect to this trait, you obtain the whole of the population. And uh, if at each time t you consider this quotient, which is in fact a probability uh, density function, then you have the distribution of the trait in the population and you can study its asymptotics. So from the point of view of uh, cancer cell populations, it amounts to uh, follow tumor growth uh, and uh, the asymptotic distribution of a relevant trait. In this uh, way, you do not see space as a relevant uh, structure variable, but it can be uh, uh, added as uh, we with uh, Alexander Lortz and uh, Tommaso Lorenzi and uh, Benoit Pertam also developed in another paper, paper of 2015. Now, uh, it's possible, and this here comes the uh, uh, evolution equation to, uh, exemplified such, uh, uh, um, let's say, uh, uh, an instantaneous uh, proliferation rate by uh, this um, non-local uh, logistic um, uh, term, which is here the d of x times rho of t, which represents competition of one cell with all cells in the population. But of course, there should be also a proliferation, uh, an intrinsic proliferation rate. And the whole of the parenthesis makes the intrinsic, the, not the intrinsic, but the net proliferation rate, uh, which is just, uh, as you can see, the logarithmic derivative of the population. 
and uh, assuming reasonable hypothesis and uh, uh, the um, functions R and D, you can show um, with, and first you, you show that uh, uh, with this hypothesis, the, the variable rho is uh, of bounded variations and that it converges. And also that uh, uh, not only does it converge to a constant value, but also that there is concentration uh, of the um, uh, phenotype uh, within the here the uh, continuous uh, spectrum between zero and one and on a zero measure set which if by hypothesis it is reduced to a single a singleton then you have uh, in the space of measure uh, convergence of the population towards a constant uh, multiplied by a Dirac concentrated on the singleton. If it's not a singleton, then it should be a sort of Dirac cum, uh, at least um, um, a set of measure zero within the zero one. And this has been developed in papers by uh, Pouchol and, and et al and Pouchol and Trella. Now let's come to therapeutics. Uh, pitfalls of therapy in cancer, as you all know, are side effects, that is effects on healthy cell populations and tissues in um, far as, insofar as uh, uh, cell cancer cell populations are concerned, drug resistance and uh, also metastasis. I will not uh, say anything about metastasis, which is related to EMT, but others are, are doing it in particular. Here, Jules Gilberto, who is uh, developing uh, with us, uh, with uh, not me, but uh, um, with um, Nastasia Pouradier Duteil and uh, Camille Pouchol, also uh, PhD thesis, with ODEs and PDEs uh, in a very nice way that maybe you will see soon uh, uh, presented in a paper. So, we have to take into account this unwanted side effect if we want to have this therapeutic optimization perspective because all cancer drugs are active also to healthy tissues. And we have also to take into account drug resistance in cancer because it is a, a big problem, uh, maybe the most important problem except maybe metastasis. And if we attack it from the time at which it is completely reversible, then uh, we can have uh, maybe more chances of success. So plasticity must be represented at this stage by uh, uh, drug resistance uh, effects. And uh, you may have seen also this uh, uh, set of uh, equations. It's exactly the same equation that uh, I have represented uh, before. That is, you have here the intrinsic proliferation rate the uh, non-local lotka volterra death rate, but you add, of course, uh, um, a death term due to uh, one cytotoxic drug, which is an added death term. And you can add also uh, what I call the cytostatic drug, which will just slow down the proliferation rate by slowing down the uh, cell division course velocity. Uh, in fact, it must be noticed that in the uh, functions that we use to try and uh, uh, represent uh, these uh, um, cell population uh, dynamics, uh, we uh, had in mind the hypothesis that only cytotoxic drugs are um, important because they are the only uh, drugs that are uh, life-threatening. The cytostatic drugs do not induce so much uh, resistance because, uh, at least not at first, because they are not so life-threatening, except, of course, if you give them at uh, very high doses. So we developed, um, uh, and I think that um, Tommaso was still present at that time, uh, with uh, uh, then uh, other people with uh, Alexander Lotz and lately with uh, Camille Pouchol, we developed this model concerning not only cancer cells, but also healthy cells uh, exposed to the same drugs, U1 cytotoxic and U2 cytostatic. 
then it's possible to do a sort of pedestrian optimization. Uh, this nice picture was developed uh, by uh, Tommaso, as far as I remember. And it was uh, designed to show that uh, with uh, adapted coefficients uh, under functions, R, D, and mu, you can obtain um, a representation of the survival of the healthy cell population, but uh, extinction of the cancer cell population. So this was a, a first attempt. And uh, uh, later came uh, the work um, that was uh, developed in his PhD thesis by uh, Camille Pouchol about, uh, with the uh, absolutely indispensable uh, help of uh, Emmanuel Trella, with uh, the, um, the idea of the, the same equations, the same evolution equations, but with the idea of uh, uh, doing some optimal control uh, on this uh, problem. And the optimal control problem is a fixed horizon problem trying to uh, minimize the final quantity of the cancer cell population uh, at fixed uh, capital T uh, horizon in time with additional constraints on healthy cell because you should not be too harmful to uh, healthy cells if you want to be uh, also active in cancer cells. So this is a clinical, uh, sort of clinical consideration. And first of all, it must be noticed that uh, in this uh, representation, we have uh, the fact that uh, uh, if we use constant doses of uh, high doses of drugs, then you inevitably develop res drug resistance. Here, you develop a high peak of uh, drug resistance, which is close to one because uh, uh, I um, took zero for sensitivity and one for complete uh, resistance. Uh, and uh, you have absolutely catastrophic effects on the total cancer population and uh, on the total healthy cell population. So this was one of the first uh, illustrations uh, of the relevance of uh, the, the model we developed. Then uh, a theorem which is not uh, completely uh, easy to, to develop uh, in a few minutes, uh, but illustrated in the next uh, uh, slide, tells us that in fact, the uh, optimal control um, strategy is this one, giving at first almost nothing, uh, supposing of course that you have uh, firstly reduced the, um, uh, the tumor to an admissible uh, volume but for some time do absolutely nothing. Uh, in cytotoxics, you can also try to reduce, to shrink, to keep the tumor shrunk with the cytostatics, but at a, a determined time, give a very high dose of cytotoxic, not before that time, and then you make the cancer cell population shrink a lot. But during that time, uh, before that time, sorry, it grows, it grows and grows, but uh, on a limited time, and this is due, of course, to the lot cover terra like uh, um, uh, way of representing the, its growth. But then it drops down, the cancer cell population drops down, whereas the healthy cell population drops also down, but here you reach the constraint, and this is the reason why you should give uh, a mid dose or sometime in between zero and uh, maximum for the cytotoxic drug. So this is um, the way that was uh, uh, confirmed at the different uh, horizon, uh, horizon times to be optimal. Well, we, it should be noticed that uh, in the clinical, in clinical oncology, this uh, strategy when you do nothing for some time is called drug holiday and it is uh, used but not necessarily with the same interpretation as we have uh, to make the cell population be prepared to, to be again uh, insulted by drugs. So uh, almost periodic therapeutic strategies uh, are not so um, important um, but uh, this should be again developed and I will not um, uh, waiting for some uh, other uh, PhD students to come develop uh, this um, 
this way of uh, uh, adapting to the, the actual oncology clinic by these almost periodic therapeutic strategies that are not so optimal. Now, a uh, thing that uh, is underway is um, about modeling is uh, bet hedging in cancer. Tommaso, uh, not Tommaso, but Marcello, do I have uh, still a few minutes? Yeah, 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 you have, uh, well, I, I think that uh, you can have uh, seven minutes almost. Okay, thank you. So I, I will be brief, I think. So in this um, modeling, uh, which is underway, we try to represent by uh, an equation that you might recognize as uh, closely related to the Kane Toad equation that was developed uh, um, by uh, Emeric Boin and uh, also um, uh, Vincent Calvez and others. We have the idea that um, by introducing not only uh, fecundity and viability, as was the case in the paper with uh, Rebecca and Tommaso, sorry, uh, six years ago, to introduce plasticity as a structuring variable that in fact will affect the, um, the uncertainty on the, the development of the, uh, of, of the trait X and Y. This is a very general statement and uh, also on uh, uh, an advection term here. But the idea is um, in a simplified way, it would be just a theta in front of an ablation here. And uh, it's um, intended to develop um, what is uh, the analogy with, uh, in the case of the Cain-Todd equation, the dispersal rate, which is for me plasticity, that is, uncertainty on uh, the development of um, um, the two uh, other structure variables, which are fecundity and viability. In fact, this has been uh, online for a certain time, and Tommaso at least knows of it, but recently it has been revived with um, a PhD student. And uh, I also propose that uh, this to be represented as a divergence uh, um, phenomenon in, uh, in um, between phenotypes, between fecundity and viability, could be also a way to represent the origin of multicellularity by divergence of phenotype, by sort of branching, but branching uh, in a reversible way at first. Another thing that I uh, have uh, on, uh, on, online, uh, in working with another PhD student is the immune checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapies. So this is not the cannonade as uh, practiced by cytotoxic drugs, but it's reinforcing the killing power of the immune cell police. That is the T lymphocytes, uh, NK cells, and uh, also, as, as you know, are concerned the uh, antigen, um, antigen uh, presenting cells, uh, dendritic cells, B lymphocytes, etc., that are uh, messengers from the tumor to the uh, or lymphoid organs, but altogether they form what I call the immune cell police, that is the immune response to um, the cancer uh, under development. And the immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, as some of you at least know, are um, a way of uh, representing uh, um, a boosting of the immune cells, in particular of the T lymphocytes, that by immunoediting from the tumor are in fact little by little weakened. And so it's uh, the, the action of these uh, ICI uh, molecules is a weak weakening of the weakening, if I may say so, which will uh, be translated by uh, a boosting of the uh, of the action of the simian police. And it's um, at the beginning, but of course we will have to um, cope with a, a strong constraint because uh, um, these immune therapies have uh, first of all limited success and also uh, sometimes hyper progression and we do not understand at least uh, the Clinicians do not understand when it works and when it doesn't. 
So this may be represented by uh, this uh, um, simple structured model with uh, two populations with a, a structured trait, uh, which is malignancy trait for the um, uh, cancer cells, which is a sort of uh, progression towards stemness. And uh, it, it might be uh, measured by, uh, for instance, uh, the expression of uh, um, genes like the Yamanaka genes uh, that uh, express D uh, differentiation. And uh, for the competent lymphocytes that are represented here, already at the tumor site, an aggressive net trait which is uh, maybe more difficult to define, but it certainly exists as um, the uh, immunologists of cancer tell us about the fact that these lymphocytes are uh, in a state of fatigue and uh, after some time they absolutely need to be boosted. And so there must be an underlying um, uh, structure variable that we, I represent here by this Y anti-tumor aggressive trait. And also, uh, finally, uh, another population, which is a naive cell population at the lymphoid organs. So we have been uh, beginning, I have nothing to present be because it's uh, still uh, beginning. We have been with a PhD student, begin, began to develop this kind of models, which is absolutely relevant for ICI therapy, because as you know, ICI therapy is completely, um, quantitative. It has nothing to do with uh, antigens and antibodies, which are, by the way, represented in uh, um, at least the APC message in this um, integral term, this weighted uh, integral function that comes as a source term in the lymphoid organ populations. So this is another thing we work on, but uh, as I wanted also to, to have uh, something uh, for future work and uh, future work that is uh, still way, um, way ahead of us uh, from the clinician point of view, is trying to reinforce what I call the cohesion watch, that is the extended uh, vision of the immune system that make, makes a multicellular organism uh, stick together stick selling cell sticking together by some uh, um, function of the immune system which as I said uh, should likely be related to the um, position information that all cells in a multicellular organ uh, organism have from embryogenesis until uh, adult cell life adult organism life so we should uh, investigate, and biologists, of course, mainly, should investigate intercellular connections during development and what can they be at the uh, adult state. And um, probably this could be, a, uh, this could be a, a, a leading step towards non-cell killing anti-cancer therapies. Of course, it's a, a dream so far. But I think that it's not unreachable because so far we have considered only cell killing therapy, therapeutics and uh, immune, uh, immune cell therapeutics is also of this kind. And uh, maybe we could do finer therapeutics by using this kind of uh, uh, reformatting the cohesion watch. So as a way of conclusion, we uh, should go on with the uh, therapeutic tracks with what is available for us, that is a uh, cell killing therapeutics, be they just cytotoxic chemotherapies or immunotherapies, but also uh, we still have a lot, lot of things to understand about immunotherapies. And here I allude that William Cowley's founding experiments in cancer immunotherapy, and we have not understood what make, made it work in some cases, and what made it uh, a failure. And so there are still many things to understand in immunotherapy. And uh, going further than cell killing therapies, we could try to um, develop uh, uh, therapies dedicated to a larger view, uh, wider view 
of the immune system and trying to understand what could be re-established in this uh, uh, cohesion watch that, as I said, might be related to uh, the expression of uh, info, uh, position information that is probably underexpressed in at least locally in cancer. So with this, I will thank you for your attention and refer to references um, uh, of a recently or less recently published articles. And of course, this um, presentation and um, maybe a more extended uh, form of it will be available to everybody.